Okay, so the second session that I'm going to be talking about is how to attract and engage sponsors. And uh, this will not relate totally to, this will not be totally different than what you usually do. So in the first part, I'll be talking about how you can actually um, prepare to find the sponsors, some of the rules, how do you engage with them. And then in the last part, I'll, I'll be talking a bit more about the specific coronavirus situation and how uh, you know, you can still engage with your sponsors during this time where uh, people might not be able to have uh, enough money as businesses to, to sponsor uh, and what you can do. So, so first of all, I'm going to be talking about what sponsorship is. So sponsorship is a means of supporting an event, project or organization by providing money or other resources of value to the uh, event or project in question. And the sponsor generally receives advertising space um, or other publicity at the event in exchange for supporting that sponsor or in, ex in exchange for the money that they are paying you or any um, services that they are providing. So getting the right sponsors to join your uh, join forces with you can make a big impact on the success of your event or project. It is a guaranteed revenue source. And if you partner with relevant companies, the relationship will also provide added value to attendees. And this is really, really important. You shouldn't be looking just for sponsors for the sake of money, because people who are attending your event, if they're not engaging with a sponsor, or they feel that the sponsor is very much forced upon them, they will be annoyed and they will not really value that relationship as much as you do. So first we'll be talking about some rules that you have to keep in mind uh, while hunting for sponsorships. Um, so sponsorships are about more than sticking logos and everything. Follow these rules to ensure you find the right sponsor for your organization. So the first thing that you have to keep in mind is that there is no such thing as free money. Sponsorship, sponsorship is not just about your needs. It's also about the sponsors. It won't work if the relationship is too lopsided one way or the, the other. And this is really, really important. When you're getting this free money from a sponsor, it's not really free. You have to give them something in return. And that is, we're gonna talk about uh, it's later about what things you can do in return. But don't ever think that if you're getting uh, a sponsorship, it means that this uh, the company will not hold you liable if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain. And then uh, it's different from a donation because people donate money and uh, they don't know what the outcome is going to be. And even donations, sometimes you have to give the uh, big donors uh, some sort of purpose. Another thing that you have to know is that sponsors don't have to love you. Sponsors don't need to share your passion for your cause in order to sponsor you. <clears throat> they just need to be able to see the commercial benefit. It is important though that you have compatible values. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's say you are doing a project about cleaning the ocean um, from, from garbage. You cannot go and partner with uh, a company that has ships that pollute the water with the, the oil, uh, oil spills from their ships. That is counterintuitive and that is just very hypocritical because if you are cleaning um, the ocean from garbage and from oil spills and then this company uh, that is actively polluting the ocean is sponsoring you then the, uh, you will look hypocritical to um, your members, your audience, and to the public. It's the same thing is, uh, is as if you're doing an event for uh, vegetarians and vegans and have McDonald's as your sponsor. So it's important that to have a, a compatible sponsor of the similar values to your project and to your organization. So similar to what I talked about, you should be looking for a good fit. 
do your very best to gain sponsorship from companies, organizations, or brands that seem a natural fit with your event or organization. It is exhausting to have to be continuously trying to ram a square peg in a certain round hole. So it's really, really important to make sure that your values are aligned. Sometimes you might have an amazing partner or made amazing sponsor. They have a lot of resources, maybe thousands of members. You can, they can do a lot of things, but you are uh, always in conflict with them or you don't uh, feel comfortable with their leadership and you always clash. And even if you're, they're providing you all the money in the world, if they're not allowing you to do the project that the way that you want to do it, then it might not be a, a good fit. Now, definitely sometimes you have to do some compromises, uh, you know, uh, tweak or change some things to, you know, fit your partners. But if you are completely changing the project just to benefit a sponsor or benefit a partner, then maybe you have to re-evaluate that partner or sponsor. Also, it's a job for a team. That's why sponsorship is important to you. And it's prepared to treat your sponsor, sponsors like marketing partners. It's very important that everyone on your team knows what you're doing with that partner and knows who the partner or the sponsor is and knows uh, what they do as a company. Because imagine if you're running an event and one of your members is talking to a representative from the sponsor and they don't know anything about them. Or if they talk badly about them in front of other people and the sponsor knows, then you're never going to get the sponsorship again. So it's really important to have the team effort there. Also, you should vaccinate against the log logoitis, which means that the putting your sponsor's logo on, on things is not the only way um, to benefit your sponsor. And usually it doesn't really get them any uh, extra added value because you know there's so many logos uh, posted everywhere. People won't really engage with that sponsor just of their logo. So sponsorships are about more than just sticking the logo on everything. While your sponsorship agreement might include the use of logos, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. If that's all you've got to offer, you can't really ask for that much in return. So how much money is a sponsor really going to give you just for, for putting a logo on a poster or roller pan? Another very important tool is to get started early. And we'll talk about that more a bit later. But don't count on starting your sponsorship search one day and getting it all underway in a very, very long time. Allow plenty of time in your forward planning. So if you're doing an event in a month, I guarantee you will not be able to find a good proper sponsor today. And we're gonna talk about that more, but definitely when you're planning, when you have an action plan for your organization, start contacting relevant partners and sponsors when you put that action plan. <coughs> and then it's really important to get everything in writing, especially when you agree with a sponsor. So draw up a contract and have both parties. And we'll talk a bit more about that, but make sure to get things in writing. You can't imagine how, how many sponsors bailed out on the day of the event because they don't have any responsi written responsibility. And you know, a lot of corporations are not very ethical when it comes to these things. So it's really important to have something written down. It can be an email or it can be a drawn up signed contract. <clears throat> and then also it's very important for you to aim high. It is better to get one or two big sponsorship, big and meaningful and relevant sponsorships in place of 10 or 20 or 30 small sponsorships of $50 to $100 because there will be a lot of clutter, a lot of logos, a lot of people to manage. And then the sponsors are not easy to deal with. When someone's giving you money for free, they will be expecting to be treated like 
royals and they'll be calling you all the time and they'll be needing things from you all the time and you have to do them a lot of favors. So if you have 30 of those, have time to do your project, you'll end up managing these sponsors for the majority of your time. And then it's very important to allow time for relationship building. Don't ever think that once you've got the check, your job is done. As with most things in fundraising, sponsorships are all about the relationship. You need to be in, regu in regular contact. You need to give thanks when it's due and you need to ensure that you're always doing what you said you'd do. And this is also very important when you have multiple sponsors. If you thank one and you wait until the next day to put a post about the other sponsor, they will get upset. So make sure that you're treating all your sponsors fairly. Uh, do not favor one uh, more, uh, more than the other, especially one in front of each other. So try as much as possible to be as fair as possible with your partners so that you don't upset any of them. <clears throat> Now, as we talk with the online meetings, it's also very, very, very important to be well prepared. And this is also the biggest part and the most crucial part about being prepared to uh, get a sponsorship. So you cannot approach a sponsor without having done the necessary research and work. And this is usually the, the toughest part of the process. The first thing you have to do is define the fundamentals of your event. So cl uh, clearly articulate the differentiating factors of your project. What makes it different? What makes it unique? And try to answer these questions. What is the overall vision of your project? What overreaching goals are you trying to achieve through the project? And what are the values of your organization or the project? Even if you were to find companies who are interested in your project, you will only win them over once they buy into the project goals and vision. Thus make sure to have these core factors explicitly defined before beginning the search. <clears throat> Being able to clearly communicate these values will be crucial in helping you find these sponsors. <clears throat> and then it's also uh, important to understand and know why companies want to sponsor events. If the goal is to find companies that are interested in sponsoring projects, the primary step should be to understand why these companies are looking for sponsorships. In the end, sponsoring a project or an event is a significant investment for the company. So it is important to become knowledgeable on the types of return on investment or ROI that these companies are expecting to see. So when a company is putting money in your project, they are expecting something, either more sales or more media mentions or just to look good in the community. So they have specific goals that they want to achieve that are different than the goals that you have for your project. <clears throat> so here are some examples of some ROI or some benefits of the company sponsoring your events. The first one is, increasing social media mentions. Because projects and events are a great platform for social media content, companies see the perfect opportunity to, to elevate their social media presence through sponsoring projects. If your project is particularly well suited for social media sharing, companies will be very much interested in promoting their own social media channels and thinking of ways to push partnered content. If it is executed properly, this can be a win-win for all parties involved. And I'll give you an example. In 2018, when I was national president of JCR Lebanon, we were holding World Cleanup Day in Lebanon for the first time. And it was a massive event. Uh, we had 35 locations for a country as small as Lebanon. It was a massive thing to do. 3,500 volunteers when our organization barely has hundreds. So it was a very big event. One of our partners for the event was Burger King. And they had approached us because they wanted to become a more green friendly uh, company in Lebanon. Through all of that, they created so much social media content for work cleanup day on their Burger King accounts 
they created videos and animations and tips for people and invited their customers to come down on the street. They even um, gave out uh, burgers and something that they've not never done before. They didn't give any plastic away. Everything they were using was recyclable. Even the water bottles were recyclable or reusable glass bottles. So we were able to align our goal of working up day with a company that is usually not very um, clean because they wanted to become a more green company. So they use all, this, uh, all the hype to tell people that Burger King is trying to work on recycling. Burger King is trying to work on uh, reducing uh, pollution and reducing uh, waste. So that really aligned with us and they were able to do a great campaign on social media for themselves. And then some companies, they want to collect customer leads. Many companies are excited to the prospect of getting more potential customers through event sponsorships, especially if the uh, attendee demographic overlaps with the target customer base. Companies see sponsorship as a great opportunity to grow their sales pipeline and increase the number of potential um, closed deals. So definitely in the end, the company is there to make profit. And then the, the reason they sponsor you is to get their name out there to make more profit. So that shouldn't be a surprise. And so the return on investment here is how much new customers are they getting or how much sales are they getting because of their sponsorship? And the third example is gaining access to a specific demographic. And this is something that we do very well. As JCI, we are a, an organization that, um, uh, whose members are only between 18 and 40. And a lot of corporations right now are really, really having trouble reaching the young demographic because companies don't understand what TikTok is or what Snapchat is or what Instagram stories are or what the people are interested in, the young people or what the new slang words are or the memes or, you know, all of that, they do not understand. Most companies, their CEOs are in their 50s and their 60s. Their board of directors are really old. Their marketing managers are 40 and above. So how can they relate to the young demographic? And this is where we come in because how we understand what the youth want, how the youth act. And this is one way that we can attract sponsors to target the youth demographic. So these companies, as I said, have a difficult time tapping into certain demog demographics due to limited resources or the general lack of exposure. However, sponsorships offer a way to get in front of a specific target audience that may have been inaccessible otherwise. Companies are especially interested in sponsoring projects if the sponsorship can give the brand the exposure it needs in regards to a specific demographic. And you know, some examples of these can be restaurants or fast food, it can be cereal brands, it can be things that the youth really care about, technology, um, you know, you can see a lot of different uh, um, uh, interests for the youth that are not available or people are not interested in if they're older. So the youth are less interested in politics, but more interested in uh, human rights, equality, uh, saving the environment, being more vegan, uh, you know, these types of things. And the older generation does not get that. And the way that we can try to link our uh, audience with the sponsorship can really benefit us on both sides. So here it's really important to define the sponsorship criteria. Having clearly established cl criteria for the type of sponsors that you want to partner with is crucial to the overall success of the sponsorship. So it's helpful to keep in mind a few questions when speaking uh, to potential sponsors to see if they would align with your e event or your organization's vision. So these are, how do you see your organization's mission statement aligning with our event? So you were asking them these questions. How do they see their company aligning with our event? And with the example that I gave you with Burger King, because they were trying to become more green, it was their first step to go into that domain. What are your core company values and key brand values? So what does their company value 
other, obviously aside from profit. And how can you align that to what we can offer them? And then you can also ask them what are the uh, return on investment metrics that they wish to increase through sponsorship. So if they're giving you $10,000, do they expect 10 new customers or 100 or 1,000 or how many new leads or how many emails that they're getting from their booth or different things, how many pictures, sometimes they do competitions on a booth in an event or you know how many uh, people they want to, to interact with. So ask them what are the metrics that they are looking for. And then ask them what are your main goals as an event sponsor? Why are they sponsoring? What do they want to gain aside from you know the customers? What is their main goal? Once you get the answers to these questions, you know what you can offer them and you know how much money you can ask them for and you know how you can integrate the sponsor with your attendees or your members. In terms of preparation, we still have a lot to go and it's also really, really important to research companies that have sponsored projects similar to yours. So here comes the importance of researching because I'm sure your project is not the first project in its domain, right? And there's a lot of projects that require sponsorships, can it be from government bodies or from grants or from uh, companies, from other NGOs, from the United Nations Agency, a lot of different things. So look for those events and go on their website and go on their sponsors page. If these companies were interested in forming event partnerships with these events or projects, there's going to be a chance, there's a really good chance that they'll be interested in yours. So if possible, and if they're not a direct competitor, get in contact with the project event organizer and ask for tips on shaping the event sponsorship package. Conversations like these will provide key insight as to what these companies are looking for. So if you have a, if you have a partner organization that got a sponsor that you that might be interested in your event and you're on good terms with that organization or with one person in that organization, try to get feedback about that sponsor. Try to see what they like, how much money they sponsor. You know, sometimes they will not tell you, but it's always to get it's always good to get as much information as possible. And there are some online resources that you can uh, use. Uh, and that can connect you to, uh, to all sponsors. Some of them might not work in Africa. Some of them might, some of them will, will connect you to international sponsors. So uh, look them up. Here, I just have a few. One of them is Sponsor My Event, which is a platform for organizers and sponsors alike to connect with one another for potential partnerships. Another one is a Sponsor Pitch, which facilitates quick, smart connections between sponsoring brands and sponsoring opportunities. And then um, there's also sponsor pack or sponsor pack, which is geared towards event organizers. So this is more for events rather than projects like conferences or trainings or you know um, conventions requiring all organizers to post event sponsorship proposals and then wait to be contacted by interested sponsors. And then there's also um, Sponeasy, which can be used by event or project organizers to create aesthetically appealing proposals and then post it on in the network for potential sponsors to uh, look through it. So we're going to talk about what to do, uh, what to put in the sponsorship proposal, but this website here can help you design one that looks nice. And then when you're doing your research regarding companies, you have to look for companies that have the right resources. So you shouldn't, if you, if you need $10,000, you, should, you shouldn't be going to a small mom and dad restaurant and ask them for $10,000. Obviously you're wasting your time and their time. So companies interested in sponsoring events must also be in a position to do so. So try to target companies with sufficient budgets. It's also important. So we're talking about matching, uh, finding companies with the right resources. If companies do not have advertising or marketing departments, they usually don't see the value of sponsorships because most of the time when you're doing a company, a sponsorship with a company, it has to go through uh, their advertising or marketing departments uh, and they see the value of sponsoring. Now that doesn't mean that small, small companies or, you know, 
mom and dad shops will not donate to you or you know sponsor you one time for a small thing but if as we talked about in the beginning we should be aiming high and looking at bigger sponsors because if we keep getting 20 or 30 sponsors it's going to be a bigger headache for us And then the third thing that you should be looking into is companies through referrals from current sponsors or even past sponsors or partners. So if you if you have current sponsors that you're working with on several projects, they can easily recommend you uh, recommend to you their suppliers, uh, their partners, <clears throat> or any people that they know that might have money or resources to support your project. So try to ask them um, for, you know, some connections or referrals. <clears throat> now, if you want to brainstorm and think about where you can find these um, corporate sponsors, here are some ideas. Gather a list of prospects with contacts, uh, information from last year's events. So last year, what, what kind of events did you do? Sit with the directors, see who paid what, who did what, who provided you with what, and tap into that. And an easier way is to have a national and local database of all the sponsors who, who and even partners that you work with throughout the years, with their contact information, with their contact person, email, website, all this information, how much they paid in the past. And that way, every time you need a sponsor or you need to know what happened in the past, you can just log into that database and find all that information. Another thing that you can do is have your event committee members make a list of businesses that they have connections with. So if you're in a local chapter, do a general meeting and ask if people know any companies who uh, work in the green field or might be interested in, in sponsoring a project related to garbage or coronavirus or whatever. I assure you, every member knows someone important in a different field. Some of them might even be media and it's not mentioned in this presentation, but it's very important for you to leverage media <clears throat> to get sponsors. So if you have a media partner that's willing to give you an interview or put a TV ad for you or anything like that, then you can use that as leverage to find sponsors. Ask your board members, your board and your members who they know at local businesses. And then look through your donor database, definitely. Uh, so you, we have to do this distinction between donors and sponsors, but it doesn't hurt to look into your donor database. Look through your um, payables for sponsor prospects. Payables are people that you pay, so your suppliers. Sometimes uh, you need to buy, you know, uh, food or equipment or rent a chairs or a hotel room or uh, like a a conference room or a hotel room for visitors from abroad, you know, a lot of different people that you usually pay money to get things for, they can be your suppliers uh, and they can also be sponsored sometimes to get more recognition. And um, this can happen a lot with, you know, universities. For example, when we hosted the national uh, president's meeting this year in Beirut, for all the, the national presidents from Africa and the Middle East who were partnering with one university, uh, EZA, which provided us the location for free. In return, they got publicity to their university and they got our members interested in doing their masters at that university. And they were also provi providing uh, schol discounted scholarships for those who wants to do master's degrees there from our members. So they didn't really give us uh, any money, but we, instead of renting a hotel room that would have cost us, let's say $1,000 for three days or more, we were able to get that service for free. So also sometimes when you're finding corporate sponsors, you don't necessarily need to get cash. Sometimes they can provide you something that you really need for free. Um, look around the community for companies that have mission and visions that are aligned with yours. And they're not very hard to find. There's a lot of um, organizations, for example. Uh, in Lebanon, for, uh, for example, the Rotary and the Rotaract, 
were very agreeable to um, partner with us, even though in some countries they might consider us as their rivals. Uh, during World Cleanup Day in 2018, they were able to handle several locations across Lebanon on their own while joining our event. And then we had several meetings with them after to try and see where we can align uh, together and not you know, um, waste resources doing the same projects. Similar to the UN agencies, uh, the United Nations uh, in Lebanon are one of our biggest partners and they provide us with a lot of things and sometimes they don't give us directly money, but they refer us to, sp to potential sponsors. They refer us to governments, uh, government entities because they are so well connected and during World Cleanup Day, they were able to uh, connect us to media that aired our uh, ad on TV for free for a few weeks, something that would have cost us around $15,000 to do. So try to use uh, uh, your connections. And definitely when you partner with, with other organizations, they might be able to help you with your sponsors as well. And then when you uh, decide on the companies that you want to approach, focus on the key decision makers in those companies. In the end, it will only be a handful of people who make the ultimate decision to sponsor your project. With that in mind, make sure to reach out to those individuals sooner than later. So in order to find these people, you can use LinkedIn or hunter.io for targeting these relevant stakeholders. Once you find their contact information, send them a personalized sponsorship email that will pique their interest. The more you know about each stakeholder, the more you'll able, be able to craft the ideal messaging to further persuade them to become a sponsor. And then let's talk about who these people actually are. So definitely you have to avoid the obvious titles. So if someone's title is the CEO, definitely, unless you know them personally, you should not be contacting the CEO because he will uh, ignore your email, definitely. He will ignore your call if he's too busy. And sometimes even the sponsorship manager might not be the target for you because they'll be swamped with so many offers at the same time and they'll be very busy. And so when people keep going to the sponsorship manager, you can try to get your support from someone else. And definitely that person will at some point refer you to the sponsorship manager when you agree on the sponsorship. But you have to, con but you have to convince these key stakeholders. <clears throat> so the brand team is your best friend. Brand managers focus on the public image, which is one of the strongest benefits of sponsoring an event. Put them at the top of your list when reaching out. So brand manager, account manager, marketing manager, um, advertising manager, these people really care about the image of the company because it's their job to make it better. For um, smaller companies, follow the money. So anyone in charge of budgeting or an, at a national or a regional level will likely be in control of the funds available for event sponsorship. And even if they don't give you, if they're not allowed to give you the approval, it's not their decision to make, they will be able to tell you if the company has a budget for sponsorships or not, and how much you can ask for. And also you have to consider who you already know, and this is really, really important. There is no reason why a company you already uh, have a relationship with couldn't be your sponsor. Start within your network and reach out to, uh, uh, to people you have a dialogue with already. And this can also be not just the company that's already sponsoring you, but can also be about people that you know in, in your life, your friends, your, your friend's cousins, you know, these six degrees of separation that we talk about is really helpful because sometimes you know a cousin who works in a company who can introduce you to the marketing manager, or you know a friend who, whose friend knows someone at a company. And you'd be surprised at how much people are willing to help. And this is usually how we've done uh, uh, a lot of our sponsorships. Now let's talk about something also really important, which is the timing. When you should be sending your sponsorship uh, requests. And 
with JCI, it's very, very hard because we are one year to lead organization. And if you don't have an action plan and a strategic plan, it's going to be really hard to find sponsors for the main reason that sponsors, they put their plan or companies, they put their fiscal financial plans in October and November for the next year. So if you approach them in January, they have already allocated where their sponsorship budget is going to be. And then most of our local boards get their, um, their mandates in January. And then they go and try to, to um, get sponsorships. And the companies will, come, will tell them, oh, we already spent our budget or oh, we already have allocated our budget to this and this and that. So it's really important that if you are going to ask companies for money, you do that in before they um, finish their financial fiscal closing. So some companies do that in December. So I would say if you want, uh, if you want to get in on the sponsorship budgets, do it one month or two months or three months in advance. And this is where it's very important that when your local organizations do their elections in October, that the action plan for the upcoming year is done, then you can go in October and send the sponsorship kits and ask companies for money for projects that are happening next year. Another important thing is that the holiday months so anything around Christmas or Easter or Eid or any holiday that any major holiday that your country observes is a really bad time to ask for sponsorships. Because during that time, unless you're doing holiday themed events, during that time, the company is going to be investing most of its marketing budget into advertising to sell more. Because Christmas, for example, is the time of the year where they sell the most. So they're not going to be giving you sponsorships unless they have a CSR program that's feeding the hungry or giving close to the needy or, you know, things like that. And that's a different situation, but anything else, they will not be giving you money for. Experts say that May, June and September are the best months since sales will be likely at a high. <clears throat> so if companies are doing well, they're more likely to sponsor you if they're making more profit in those months they are in a better mood to do sponsorships. Which, which brings us to the coronavirus and how the situation is now and no one's going to be sponsoring. And we'll talk about that a bit later. But keep these in mind, make sure that you are not going at the wrong time for sponsorships. The best way to get a corporate sponsor is to make your project and sponsor experience worthy of their investment. So you have to make them feel that the money that they are putting in is worth it. And that's from how you, your members deal with them, how you answer their calls, how you go to their meetings, what sometimes you have to bring them some small gifts, sometimes you, uh, the way you introduce them, the things that you invite them to, even if they're not related to the sponsorship. So now let's talk about creating a sponsorship kit. A sponsorship kit is a document uh, or a package that you send to your sponsors uh, on your list. Your goal is to make this appear to be a win-win business deal rather than a simple donation. So as we talked about, a sponsorship is not the same as a donation. So in this document, what are the things that you should include? First, you have to write an executive summary, which is similar to your mission statement about the event or the project that you are doing, what is your goal with that? And this shouldn't be very long, around 250, 300 words, like one pager that describes in detail what uh, their sponsorship will fund and why you seek this uh, sponsorship and how being a sponsor will benefit us. You know, we're, we're, uh, we have an advantage in our organization because we, we are all volunteers. And that is something sponsors really like because they know that their money is not going into paying salaries or renting offices or, you know, these things that they don't really care about. They know that our money is going to do impact on the ground. This is something that you can highlight. Other information that you can include in your um, sponsorship kit 
is an overview about your organization and past projects, especially if you've not worked with this company before. Who is JCI? What do we do? What big projects have we done? Who's, who has been our sponsors in the past? And then who are the attendees of this project or the, uh, of this event, or if not the attendees, the beneficiaries of the project? So who is going, who is going to be benefiting from this sponsorship? And then will there be any celebrities involved? Will there be any media involved? Anything that can give them more exposure will help you a lot. What is the uh, event purpose? If you have an event video, uh, the sponsorship packages or benefits, and we'll talk about that in detail. And then it's very important to also include the terms and conditions, which means sometimes a sponsor will tell you, oh, I'm paying you all this money. You shouldn't be uh, saying something about, you know, you, should, you shouldn't be saying uh, anything about my competitor. Or you shouldn't be say you shouldn't be talking about gender equality, or blah blah blah. So they might want to put their own rules, or they might tell you, oh, you have to support this political candidate, or anything that they might want to tell. So in your terms and conditions, you have to tell them, no, we're not allowed to go into politics and religion, for example. No, we're not allowed to. Uh, no, you can't tell us not to uh, talk about a competitor if they're sponsoring. And that it depends on the packages that they take, if they're exclusive or not. So all of these details and conditions, you can also put things about if the event uh, gets canceled, what happens? Or if they don't fulfill their agreement, what happens? So all of these things you should be including in terms of conditions to protect yourself. And definitely you should also include a call to, to action. Um, where they can uh, attend the event, what they can sponsor, um, where they can, they can see more information and have a contact person with their phone number, with their email, with their picture, so that they can contact them uh, when they are ready to sponsor you. So in terms of uh, creating the, the, the packages, there are two sponsorship models. The more traditional one, which is the, which is the tiered sponsorship, sponsorship model, traditional approach where a variety of features are included in the event sponsorship package offerings, depending on the sponsorship level. And then the, the other one is a la carte sponsorship model, which is commonly used to serve sponsors with specific needs or goals. So flexibility and customization in their event sponsorship packages are key. So let's talk about the first one, and the one you're most probably familiar with is creating the tiered level ones. So there are three things that you have to keep in mind. Creating the tier levels. Tiers are commonly labeled as platinum, gold, silver, exhibitor, you know, these types of things. But you, you, have, lots, uh, you have lots of creative freedom to name the levels whatever you think best fits your project theme or brand. It's your chance to make it sound fun and appealing to sponsors. And then you have to decide on uh, the quantities per tier, how much money will each category cost. Uh, so this will, will uh, this is what you need in order to sell uh, the tiers to achieve your event revenue goals. The more limited the quantity, the more you can charge for the sponsorship package because of its exclusivity. So platinum sponsor, you can only have one. And usually if you get one platinum sponsor, you don't need anyone else. And when you're putting the budget for your event, so let's say the event will cost $20,000. What, what I personally usually do is I double that or even triple that for the platinum sponsorship. Because then I know that I have enough money for this project and other projects. And then I will not need to care about getting any other sponsors. And then usually the gold sponsor should cover all of your costs. And then anything else that you get will be extra that will be either used to make your event better with more resources or be funneled into other activities or projects. And then you have to distribute the sponsorship benefits per tier. So the higher the amount and the more exclusive the tier, the greater number of high value benefits. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. So here's one example with sponsorship benefits and you can see there are um, five different categories starting from $25,000 uh, with the most one to the 2,500 to the least one. 
and you can see the names. They call them lion, jaguar, leopard, lynx, and cheetah. They didn't go with the gold, silver, you know, all of that. And then here, they divided the different um, benefits according to uh, the different stages of the event. So we have the pre-event benefits, we have the on-site or during the event, and we have the post or after the event benefits. And then you can also see the difference, for example, how many free tickets they're getting. So the biggest one is getting 125 tickets, while the smallest one is getting 10. And then you can see all the different things are different. And then here's another example, a less complicated one. They also have different names, so they didn't go with the gold, silver options. And here they start from $150 to $5,000 with grassroots advocate, organizer, uh, moment, movement builder, community leader, and champion. And then each one has a different type. And you can clearly see that the one that pays $150 don't really get most of the things. And the one that the champion is usually exclusive and they get all the benefits that you can give them. Now we're going to talk about uh, about what kind of benefits you can give them after I, I explain the a la carte sponsorship model. So this um, model approach is an alternative model for sponsors looking to achieve specific goals or outcomes. And this can include uh, attendee engagement or brand exposure. So to give you an example of this, um, we have one of our partners that they usually sponsor our location for all the meetings, uh, the meeting rooms, the conference rooms, and all of that. It's an accelerator hub for startups uh, in Beirut. Now, so instead of us paying them uh, for the cost, what they want the, the, the sponsorship or the partnership um, approach to be something a la carte. So we didn't really give them this, we don't put the logos, we don't do anything. In exchange, to them giving us the space to do our meetings, they had requested that since we are a training organization and a mentorship organization, that we give them uh, 10 hours of training a year for their startups and 10 hours of mentorship for their startups to learn from the experts that we have on things like marketing, on things like um, strategy, finance, depending on what the, the, the startup wants. So here we had to customize a sponsorship model for them to align their goals. They really don't care about their logos being on our posters. They really don't care about their newsletters. They care about getting value for their startups. And this is uh, one example of uh, a la carte sponsorship model. And this can be even done for the paid sponsorship. So sometimes, a company, a company will pay you money for an event, but they tell you you have to train my employees or you have to create an event for my employees uh, to, to be, you know, uh, to have less stress or to enjoy themselves. And I will talk some about those innovative ideas in a bit. And some of the things that you can do for a la carte sponsorship, for example, uh, the, before the event, you can include the sponsor's logo on your event registration page, any marketing communication promoting the event, such as a registration uh, invite links, provide social media shout outs to the sponsors, you can provide um, sponsors, uh, you can provide them with a space to have speakers um, to encourage the session attendance. So for example, before the event, you can do a Facebook Live with your sponsor or with one of their uh, experts or speakers about the, the event and to promote their products. Um, you can also include uh, pre-event sponsored giveaways, competitions on your Facebook page, send sponsored emails to targeted segments. So if they want to push some product or um, some sort of uh, information to your audience. Now during the event, what you can do is include challenges where um, challenges or competitions where attendees need to interact with the sponsor if they have a booth. They have to go there, either uh, find um, either find uh, a sponsor. Okay, sorry, I just notified that we are running out of time. So I think I will be needing maybe 15 more minutes. Is that fine? Director, is that fine? Yes, it is fine. 
Okay, I'll try to go as quick as possible. Um, so you can do a lot of different things on site, uh, and I will be leaving the slides so later on you can check them out if you like and go into the details. And definitely, it's also very important um, to do events, uh, do do things for your sponsor uh, after the event. So thanking them on your social media, including them in your newsletter, you know, things like that. So here are some uh, innovative, different ideas than what you're, being, what you're usually used to uh, in terms of benefits for sponsors. So sometimes you can do uh, interactive art installations. Uh, you can do sponsored live streams. So for example, you're doing this training, instead of having the JCI logo here, up here, you can have the, uh, the company's logo up there as a sponsor. You can have one of their products back here uh, and you do back here. And then you can do different things going on in the background. Sometimes you sponsor the live stream and have the speaker be the, uh, have the company be the moderator or do different things uh, in terms of live streams. You can also do a virtual reality installation in your event. You can do sponsored lounges. I really like this idea because people at events, they want to go and dress so they can go to a lounge, see the branded material of the uh, company, uh, get to know more about them, maybe try their products and all of that. I also like this one, which is Wi-Fi and phone charging stations. So people who are coming at events, especially if it's a whole day or uh, a few day events, they need to charge their phone or they need Wi-Fi. And usually you can also brand those as a specific company. You can also have them sponsor the food and drinks and have their logos on the cups or on the food or on the cake or things like that. Um, you can also do a station where, where you can uh, stress reducing stations. So maybe it can be a yoga station, maybe people like the lounges where people can take a small nap, uh, you know, things like that. You can also do a smart wall or a smart table that is sponsored by them and have uh, things, videos and things going on uh, on that stream. Um, have sponsored social media feeds. So sometimes when you have a big screen where you're tracking the hashtag of your event and people, what people are saying about that, that can also be sponsored. You can also do some sessions or classes that are sponsored, like fitness, can be wellness, can be yoga, can be cooking class, can be anything inside your event, uh, can be a workshop given by your, sp your sponsor. <clears throat> and then try to also think of unique giveaways. So. Don't just think about, you know, the pens and the pens and the pencils and the notepads and, you know, you know, everyone's going to throw these. I have a drawer full of notepads since like 10 years and I barely use one notepad per year. So don't go do these, you know, um, cliche giveaways. Try to think up of something that is useful, people will use. Uh, sometimes it might be a phone charger, sometimes it might be like a selfie stick, sometimes things that are hot right now and people are using. And now uh, I will quickly, quickly go through how to approach these sponsors. Once you've prepared all of that and you've prepared your kit, also you, what I would suggest is to create an initial packet when you inquire if they're interested in sponsoring the project. So before you even send them the prices or assume that they're interested, give them a teaser, send them a, a three page document where you tell them what the event is, uh, who is coming, what things uh, or themes that you'll be addressing during your project, what the event is, uh, so how, why is it unique and different from everything that exists and the date, time, place and other logistical information. So once you give them that teaser, if they like the idea, they will be like, oh, how much, how much do I need to pay? What are the packages? So they are intrigued. When you send them the money issues in the beginning, they will tend to not be interested if they don't like the prices that they see. So once they reply to your initial email and your initial event description, um, they uh, are more likely to sponsor you. And then personally, I would suggest to set up a call or meeting before you send them the details in terms of the money, because uh, it's more likely to increase their interest in your project if you talk to them on the phone or meet them face to face, rather than just sending them an email requesting sponsorship. So this is especially important with large sponsorships or big media partners. You want them to feel like you are working together to co-create an experience and the best way to do that is to start building a relationship rather than simply asking for money. 
and definitely avoid the scattergun approach. So don't just stand and, and throw all uh, the uh, um, sponsorship kits to all the companies that you might think of. It might be tempting to do that, uh, that to send you know um, as many packets as possible to as many places as you can think of, using a bland broadcast design to reach as many different avenues as possible. But this approach is wrong. You have to be judicious in sending out packets, sending packets only to the companies you honestly think will be interested in your project. So this comes to sending individualized sponsorship packets. Uh, personalize every single email packet and correspondence you send out. Take the lazy way out. Uh, taking the lazy way out will only ensure that your project never gets the sponsorship it deserves. So you have to customize your approach to each sponsor as they get on board. If you've got one company contributing $10,000 to your project, how will you treat them uh, differently than the other companies that are contributing $100? The difference should be notable and substantial from the perks you offer them publicly or to the way you talk with them on the phone. And we already talked about this. So now let's uh, talk about the tough time. You see the world here is empty sponsorship uh, in times of COVID-19. How can you find and manage sponsorships during this pandemic and how you should adapt your approach? So it's very important right now not to hibernate, not to think, oh, there's, the economy is bad. <clears throat> no one's paying money. No one really cares about our projects. That is a bad approach because if you disappear, people will forget about you. The f hibernating is the worst thing you can do right now or nothing is, uh, or doing nothing is the worst thing you can do right now. Reach out to your corporate sponsors by phone, personalized email and handwritten notes. Ask them how they are doing. Remember companies are made out of human beings. So they too are worried about the future. Ask them, ask them about how COVID-19 is impacting their company and its employees. And then don't panic. Some of your donors will pull their funding for sure. Now uh, they want to save as much money as possible. So now it is the time to position yourself as an organization that can adapt and that can continue to make an impact on the community. Remember that corporate sponsors want to jump on a winning bandwagon and not a sinking ship. So if you're still doing projects and things regarding, uh, regardless of the money that you're getting, they will know that you are still successful. And once they ready, they're ready to give you money, they will come back to you. So here, turn the mission impossible into a mission virtual. Leverage the opportunity to catapult your mission into the modern era by bringing your services online and upgrading your in-person efforts to digital um, donor or sponsor development. Going virtual will teach you three things, how to expand the reach of your mission to the entire globe, increasing the impact of your sponsors or donors gifts, and then reach, the, reach more new donors online and develop more robust ways to recognize sponsors outside of the events, improving your ability to secure general or program sponsorships. So definitely it's much more important for uh, you to get a, a sponsorship for a program that's happening over multiple years than just having one sponsor for one event. So ask not what your sponsor can do for you, but what you can do for your sponsor, especially for this time. Ask what you can do to support their company, their employees and their customers. You are after all a provider of vital, vital services in your community. Is there a way you can use your services and expertise as an organization to support your corporate partners now? So these are a few ideas. For example, you can give them tips or training on how to deal with anxiety or an employee training on how to use technology. Most people don't even know how to use Zoom. So that can be something you can do for your sponsor, for their employees. Maybe they want to do a, an event for poor people, poverty relief in the community to provide them with food or clothes or etc. Maybe you can help them manage that project. Motivational team building exercises is something that we do on a regular basis in JCI, social events to get the morale up and ask them, how can we help your team? 
So here, the, your approach, you have to consider three the three P's. Poll, which is ask your sponsors what they think uh, of if you want to turn your event into a virtual one. So if you already have a sponsor and you, instead of canceling the event, you ask them, what do they think, what their opinion is, is give them some ideas about how you can possibly meet their uh, sponsor benefits in a different way. Get their suggestions as well. And then the second thing, second step or the second P is to pivot. Instead of canceling the event, consider implementing a virtual event, a collaborative marketing event, or a non-event, which means they are just donating for your cause without having something in return. The third step is postpone. And as I said, canceling should be the last resort. Postpone your event to either give your time until lockdown is over and people are allowed to go out, or to give yourself time to plan uh, if needed, uh, to if you want to convert your event to an online one. And then also to your sponsors, you need to highlight in this time the advantages of sponsorship. So this is a good time to remind your partners and sponsors of the benefits of working with you. For example, your event can give their brand more exposure and help them generate effective leads when the economy is down. Not only are the conversations productive and positive, but they'll also help to cement your working relationship going forward. One of the first things that you can ask your sponsor is, what can you add to their sponsorship package to sweeten the deal? And thank them for their patience and for their support. So here are some of the questions you can also do to ask your sponsors how they can help you solve the money problems that you have uh, if they've already given you money in the past. So things like if they can remove the restrictions, if they give you money for a specific project, can you use that money for other operations that you, are, you have in your organization or maybe for your COVID-19 response? Could they shift from being an event sponsor if they're sponsoring one project to a program sponsor potentially giving them greater impact uh, on your mission while also giving them a more unique branding opportunity. If they're not able to fund you this year, could they, they give you notice when they are available to fund you? And then could they also introduce you to other potential funders who are doing better uh, right now and may be able to fill in the gap that they are um, that when they leave? And instead of cash, could they also give you access to their talent or to the resources to help you with converting maybe online uh, in-person events to online? So he, these are just a few ideas. I know I spoke in the end very, very quickly just so that I can finish all the points that I have. And we're only 10 minutes over. So with that, I, uh, I have done my presentation. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I will most likely be posting the slides on my slide share. I will share them on my Facebook page, which you can find, find on the slides, or you can email me um, if you do not have access to the slides. So I will also send them to JCI Nigeria to dispatch them to all local organizations.